So I want to bring a message to you today to bless you and help you uh, over the past number of weeks. You know, we've been we've been looking, of course, at what's been going on in the world and it's significant and and it's serious and um, and there's an urgency in the church worldwide to rise up and and be a strong church of prayer and uh, a strong you know force on earth so that God can work through us in these last days. And we want to be in the middle of all of that. We don't want to be spectators. We want to be participators. Amen. But today I want to take you in just a little bit different direction. And uh, and, and God just laid this message strongly on my heart for today. And I believe somebody is here that needs to hear this. And the title of this message is Look and Live. Live, uh, you're rather, your best life starts now. And what this means is we need to learn how to live our best life in any circumstance. Our best life isn't always lived in our best moments. That's when we get to uh, acknowledge the wonderful things that God has done. We have a, we have something that's an accomplishment or, you know, some, some situation we've overcome in, or we got a raise or something great has happened in our life. Those top of the mountain moments. Those are just celebrations for what God did in the valley. Amen. It's what God did to get you through the hard stuff that got you to that big mountain experience. And I believe that God wants us, like Paul said, that I've learned to be content. I've learned to thrive in any circumstance. If I'm going through hardships, if I'm, if I'm being, you know, uh, applauded, or if I'm being booed or whatever is happening, Paul actually said, I've learned that it's not about my circumstances as to how I am doing on the inside. And I think that that's something you and I have to uh, be able to allow our heads to get around. And and it's simply this, that, that what's happening to you circumstantially is not going to determine what's happening to you spiritually. And if we're going to take some spiritual authority in our life, we're going to learn how to live our best life. Your best life is lived when your spirit is in charge. And Jesus said, the only way for your spirit to be in charge every single day of your life is to do one thing. You know what he said? Crucify your flesh. Kill it. Everybody say, kill it. And here's what we need to do. When that old critical attitude, that old voice of that keeps coming out from the past and those same old go around the same old mountains that you've gone around for forever, you know, when that flesh just wants to start doing this, you know what you're going to do? You're going to kill it. Everybody say kill it. Now, we don't kill people, but we kill our own attitudes. We kill some thoughts that. Are, are wanting to put our flesh in charge. See, when your flesh is in charge, you are disempowered. When your emotions, your memories, your feelings, when all of that is running your life, all you can do is react, 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 react. And if you're in a negative situation, you're going to react negatively, of course. If you're in a painful situation, Sometimes the voice of pain can be so loud that you can't hear anything else. And I know I've, I've been there. Many of you have been there it just in t- terms of physical pain or even emotional pain. Emotional pain can be just as bad, if not worse, in some ways. And so we have to learn how to be able to handle the flesh. And so Jesus didn't say, learn to live with it. He didn't say, oh, just deal with it. He said, kill it. And to kill the flesh, we have to do also what Paul says. He says, it's no longer I that live, it's Christ that lives in me. So what does that actually mean for you and I? To live our best life, 
It needs to be Christ that's in charge of our mouth, of our thoughts, and of our attitudes. Can you say amen to that? Christ has to be in charge. And so that's a choice that you make every minute of every day. And uh, if we're going to choose to put Jesus in in the driver's seat of our life, (laughs) I guess I could uh, mention Jesus take the wheel. Oh, that's so awful, right? But in reality, if we're going to let him do that, we're going to have to learn the most important lesson of your Christian life, and that is how to silence the voice of your flesh. Your flesh is, is your old way of thinking. It's your inhibitions. It's your insecurities. It's the things that have, that have made you upset. It's the memories that you have of hurt, things that have happened in the past, and you keep bringing that up and bringing that into your future. You know, I, I know this, what you dwell on is what you bring into your life. What you're focused on is what you actually begin to uh, have or show up in your life. And so if we're focused on the right thing, we're going to live our best life in any moment, even if it's the worst moment, other people will say, how are you having so much peace? You have joy. I can tell that, that, that you know, you're, you're strong inside and yet you're going through all of this. You know what that is? That's somebody who's learned how to crucify the flesh, kill the flesh, kill the, 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 the attitude, kill the tongue, kill the thoughts, kill the emotions. Just put to death all of that stuff and let Jesus Christ actually, literally be what you focus on or who you focus on throughout the course of every day of your life. It's a process. We have to learn how to do that. But as you do, you then begin to to live a life where you're in charge. And the crises, uh, crises is that, that happen in your life and the chaoses and the and the, the things that just pop up and all of a sudden out of nowhere, you get this horrible email from somebody or a text from somebody or a bill from somewhere or you hear some news or something is, is just thrown at you to throw you off. You don't get thrown off. Maybe for a second, that old flesh wants to rise up again and you go, no, wait a minute, I already killed you. You need to lay down in that grave and shut up and be quiet. You're dead. And I'm going to let Jesus respond to every circumstance in my life. I'm, what I'm saying is easy, but doing it is a whole nother ball game. But I believe somebody here is at a point in your life where you are done being tossed around by every crisis that comes along. You want to learn how to live in peace and in strength and in charge in your life. That happens when we begin to walk out this very thing. I want to take you to a scripture in the book of uh, Numbers in the, in the Old Testament. Let me just paint the picture before I read the scripture. God's people were, had come out of Egypt, and they were in the middle of the desert. And they had pro- been promised that they would go to the promised land one day. They were en route to the promised land. However, at a certain point, they got uh, frustrated. They got fed up. They got uh, discouraged, and they began to grumble, and they basically got mad at God and mad at Moses, who was leading them. And they said to him, you know, you brought us out here in the middle of the desert, and, uh, and, and you know, where's this promised land? Where's all the blessing? Where's all the good stuff? And they, and they, they just kind of started shaking their fist in the face of God in a way. And, uh, and so what ended up happening was the Bible tells us that serpents and snakes began to crawl out from around the desert. We all know that there's lots of snakes that live in deserts. And, uh, and, and those snakes began to crawl out, and they actually attacked God's people, and many people, the Bible says, died from being bitten by these venomous snakes. And so at a certain point, the, the people uh, uh, of God came and and, uh, and they said to Moses, Moses, we have sinned against God. We have, uh, we have been ungrateful. And, you know, they, they basically repented. And they said, you got to save us from these snakes. So this is where we pick the story up now as we read in Numbers 21.8. The Lord said to Moses, make a snake, the very thing that was biting them, 
poisoning them and killing them. Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. Everybody say, look and live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived or he was healed. And the point of that message or the point of that story happening was that God was trying to share something, two things actually, I believe, with the Israelite people. Number one, sometimes when you feel you're out in a desert, you're out, you, you're, it feels like your prayers don't get answered, it feels like nothing's happening, and you start to get discouraged and frustrated, or you decide it's time for you to take matters into your own hands, I just want to tell you that even when you think God isn't doing anything, God is doing wonderful things in your life. Whether you don't see them, you don't recognize them, you don't, you, it's a spiritual thing that God is doing. You don't know what he has done behind the scenes. And, and yet we would complain because we haven't found the, the magic door number one yet. And I just want to tell you, it's not always about the promised land. Sometimes it's about recognizing that God is working in your life all the time. No matter what your feelings say, that's why we have to crucify our feelings because our feelings will lie to us. They will tell us that God isn't helping us and God isn't showing up and we'll have all these feelings and thoughts and all of this stuff and all it is going to do is steal from you the very thing that God is doing in your life. I think that when those snakes got loose that day in the desert, I think God said, all right, if you're a little tired of me, I'll tell you what, I'll just take my protection off of you and let's see what the desert looks like without me. All of a sudden they get attacked and they start dying left, right, and center. And they quickly come back. Oh God, oh God, we, yeah, you're cool. We love you. And they're all, they're all back, you know, because they had a very sharp reminder that the, the presence of God goes before you, that God is in you and in your life and in every circumstance and he's not finished yet. And sometimes we judge on the moment. We judge on the feeling. We judge on what we see right now. We judge on what somebody said. And, 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 and don't make the mistake of becoming somebody who makes judgments all the time. When you're judgmental of yourself or of other people, you have decided this is it. I've seen this and that is the entire story. And God wants you to know today that is not the entire story. God is not finished with you yet and he will bring you to the place he promised to you. But beyond that right now, you have to rejoice and know Christ is in me. He's in every circumstance. If I'm going through hell, guess what? He's going through hell with me. Yes, he is. And he's working things out and he's opening doors for you and he's closing other doors. And, and we need to just, in every situation, we need to thank God for what he is doing in our life, even if we don't see it. Somebody say amen. Very important that we learn that lesson. The other powerful, powerful thing about this uh, scripture is Jesus himself, thousands of years later, he quotes this very scripture in the book of John in the third chapter. And uh, in the uh, 14th and, and 15th verse, uh, the Bible says, or Jesus said specifically, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness. Isn't that interesting that Jesus actually refers back to this situation? Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So what was he saying? He was saying simply this. When that snake was lifted up, that snake was the representation of, of uh, disobedience. It was the representation of sin. It was the representation of death. And when that serpent, the very thing that was attacking them, God said, I want everybody to see that snake as defeated. Put that dead snake up on a pole. I want everyone to look at that snake and know that I have power over the snakes in your life. Somebody needs to hear that today. I have power over the snakes. That's why that snake was up there. I want you to look at that snake and I want you to watch 
what's going to happen to every state. If you look at that stake, then, then, then you are going to be delivered. In the same way, just as Moses lifted was lifted or lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. In the same way, Jesus was lifted up on a cross. And guess what the Bible says about Jesus? It says not that he forgave our sins. It says that he became our sins. That's a completely different level. He became our sins. Everything that you and I have ever done that wouldn't measure up to a a just and holy God, Jesus became that. He didn't just take it, he became it. I caused Jesus to become things that he was never meant to be because he became it. And in fact, that scripture continues and says, he became sin for you and me so that you and I can become the righteousness of God. He became one thing so we could become something else. Just think about it. It's a wonderful, beautiful gift, isn't it? So Jesus is lifted up and what he was on that, on that cross that day, he was the representation of sin and of death and of rejection of God, and he was hung on a cross. And the same advice is given, as in the book of Numbers, here now in the New Testament. Bible, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. In other words, he was saying, look, live. Look up and live. How do you crucify the flesh like we were talking about a minute ago? I think there are three directions that we can look in in our life. One of them is we look down. When we look down, we're, we're, the, we're the glass half empty people. All we can see is everything that's going wrong, all the terror in the world, all the anxiety around us how everybody's done us wrong. We live in anger. We live in offense. We live in all this stuff down here. And you can kind of sense those people when they come around you. They, they, you know, they, they're not bad people. They just are looking in the wrong direction. And if you have people like that in your life, uh, you know, our job is to, is to help them get a different perspective. Then there's those people that aren't just stuck there, but they're stuck here. And what happens here is when we look at other people, we blame other people, we judge other people, we point the finger at other people, we talk about other people, and other people are always the problem. And when we do that, once again, it's purely a matter of what you're looking at. You can look down here, you can look here. Both of those ways will be defeating to you. If you want to crucify your flesh, you can't look down, you can't look out. You have to look up. It's easier said than done. But in every moment, the Bible says to take our thoughts captive. Don't let your thoughts run around. Don't let your thoughts be free to cause havoc in your life. And the other thing I think that is so vital in all of this, I'm so blessed today that you came to God's house today. You know why? Because this is one opportunity that you can take your total and absolute focus and put it on Jesus and nothing and no one else. For a solid hour, you get Jesus. You have 168 hours in every week. This hour is probably the most important hour of your entire week. And any time that you spend time in the presence of God, the more time you spend in the presence of God, the more, the more, the easier it is to be looking up, to be focusing on him. You see, if God isn't, if you don't see Jesus as lifted up higher than all the problems and circumstances of life in the world, then you're going to succumb to all the pressures. But it is amazing when somebody starts to look up, how life begins to flow out of them. And when your focus is on Jesus, you fill up with him. And now you are able to encourage others. 
it's a wonderful transformation. It takes it takes a plan. It doesn't just happen. But today I want to tell you that's what God wants you to do. He wants you to look up. In the book of Luke, chapter 21, Jesus speaks uh, all throughout the chapter of Luke 21. He actually is describing what was going to happen in the last days, which happened to be right now uh, while we're alive. And it's pretty astounding. Everything that Jesus said in that passage, we are literally living in the, uh, the unfolding of all of that. And he was talking about there'll be wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and, and, and pestilence and raging weather and all of that. And we're, of course, we're experiencing all of that. But this is what he said in the 28th verse. He said, when all these things begin to take place, run and hide because it's going to get bad. Well, if you talk to some Christians, that's all you hear. Oh, it's going to get bad. Oh, it's going to get bad. I know it's going to get bad, but it's not going to get bad for you. It's going to get bad for them. Hello. Last time I checked, we got a ticket on out of here, folks. I'm just saying. But anyway, Jesus said, I mean, I love his his strength. I mean, I just, don't you love Jesus? <laughs> it, it's just such strength. He says, look, when all this stuff starts happening, when your world is literally coming apart at the seams, which it is right now, he says, stand up. Don't sit down. Don't hide. Stand up and lift up your heads. Amen. That's awesome. Your Redeemer is on his way back. Your redemption is drawing close to you. You're about to be redeemed. You're about to be rescued. Look up and stand up. Hallelujah. There is something spiritual about what I'm saying that that if you embrace it in your spirit and you have a stand up and look up attitude and you have a stand up and look up spirit and you're more excited and more impressed with the power of God than you are impressed with what the devil is doing uh, globally or in your personal life. Don't give the devil one minute of airtime. Shut him up and shut him down and crucify him in your life. Don't let him have the last word. Don't let your family hurts run your life. Don't attack the people that love you the most. Sometimes we attack the people around us that, that love us the most because they're the closest. We sometimes we take out our feelings around on people that are close to us because we kind of can get away with it. And I suppose you can for a little while. But there comes a point when you just can't take it all out on somebody. You've got to take responsibility for what's happening in your own heart and you've got to crucify it. And you've got to stand up in your life. Don't be pushed around in your life. Don't be pushed around by anyone or anything. You stand up and you look up. You make a connection with Jesus. It's not about your husband. It's not about your wife. It's not about your friends or the people around you. It's about you. If you were the only soul sitting in this room today, this would be about you. But it is about you. Stand up and look up. Have you ever just stood up in your life? I don't mean physically, but I mean you have stood up in your life and said, enough is enough. And you didn't do it out of anger. You did it out of faith. Do you understand the difference? You put your faith in God. I've done that so many times. This is it, God. I am done putting up with the devil in my life in this area. I am absolutely done with it. I am finished. There was a time when Pastor Lucinda and I were, you know, she was going through a lot of medical issues and we were having all kinds of heartaches and terrible times. But you know, there came a day when we both agreed that we would stop talking about it. We had to, because the more we talked about it, the more we cried. In fact, after all of that stuff that Pastor Lucinda went through in her life, it took me years, literally years, before I could even speak about it without breaking down and sobbing, because it hurt that bad. You didn't see me in those days, and I'm glad. You see me today because I learned how to look up and I learned to shut my mouth right and I learned to let Jesus be the only thing I focus on 
it, it, it's not an easy lesson in life, but I'm telling you, if you learn it, it'll absolutely change the game for you. You know, in 1 Samuel 30, I want to show this to you. King David, he was away with his soldiers. The enemy had come in and pillaged, taken his women, his children. Probably not unlike what we see going on in the world today. And David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him. He was the leader because the soul of all the people was grieved. Think about that. The soul of all the people were grieved. I can think about that happening in Israel right now. Every man was grieved for his sons and for his daughters. But this is what's important here. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his look you can be facing the most devastational situation but you can encourage yourself in the Lord that's something you got to do you got to make a decision I'm going to encourage I'm just not going to sit here and take it anymore how many people are just sick of sitting here and just taking whatever the devil's dishing out I, you know what you don't have to do that it's Christ in you. If I be lifted up, Jesus said, right? Last thing I want to share with you, because it's so important. I don't want to miss anything. In the book of James, this is something that we need to keep in our hearts. James says, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. And what James is saying is, sometimes we can be in this environment, we can be looking at the Word of God, I'm bringing Scripture to you, as many Scripture as, as I can possibly fit in to, to help you grasp this thought today. And we're, we're faced with the Scripture right now. We are looking at ourselves through the eyes of Scripture right now. But in, in some cases, you can get not even a block away and completely forget everything that just went on. And, and, and it won't do you any good. And James is telling us, don't be like that person who looked yourself in the mirror and you, you saw what you looked like through the eyes of God. And then you turn around and you walk out like you're still defeated. Like you're still in a bunch of anxiety, like you're still in a bunch of pressure, like you're still in a bunch of problems. No, don't you walk out of here alone. You better go out of here with Jesus. And you say amen to that. 